Well, welcome back, everybody, to part two of chapter three for Econ 143. Told you at the end of the last video that we we're going to pick it up here by talking a little bit about market equilibrium. So in economics, a market equilibrium is just the state in which the conflicting forces of supply and demand are in balance or perfect harmony. And the way to think of that is that remember that when it comes to consumers and their preferences, consumers prefer low prices. We like to buy things at low prices. The lower the price, the better. So we have these downward sloping uh, demand curves that say at the lower price, we're going to buy more. And then sellers, they love high prices. And remember, again, if you put yourself in the minds of somebody who's selling something, the higher the price, the better. The uh, more you can sell it for, then the more money you get to take home for you and your family. So again, sellers love those higher prices. Uh, that's why we have that upward sloping supply curve that says the higher the price, the more they're going to produce and sell. So we got the sellers who love the high prices. You got the consumers who love the low prices. So these are two forces that are going to kind of butt up against each other. And the point at which these two forces are in uh, perfect harmony is, again, what we call market equilibrium. And that occurs where the demand curve intersects the supply curve. So let's go ahead and draw out that graph real quick. Again, if you've had Econ 3, I'm sure you've seen it many times before. Uh, and, uh, again, if you haven't, don't worry. We're going to go through it as if you haven't seen it. So, again, you have a vertical axis. You have a horizontal axis. Not sure how that little squiggly got in there, but no worries. Getting back to it, we got price up here on the vertical axis and quantity here on the horizontal axis. And again, we're going to have an upward sloping supply curve. That's upward sloping because, again, sellers like those higher prices. The higher the price, the more they're going to want to produce and sell. And at the same time, we're going to have a downward sloping demand curve. That is downward sloping because, again, we as consumers, we like low prices. The lower the price, the better. And there's a point that should immediately jump out at you, and that is the point where those two curves intersect. X marks the spot, and that's going to give you what we call the equilibrium quantity. Call that Q star. And, again, this equilibrium quantity represents the point where quantity demanded at a certain price is equal to the quantity supplied at that same price. So the amount being offered for sale is exactly equal to the amount that people want to buy at that price. And the price at which that happens is what we call the equilibrium price, P star. So that's market equilibrium. That's all it is. It's where supply and demand intersect, or where quantity and demand is equal to quantity supplied. Uh, with that in mind, though, we're going to go through a few kind of details or points about this equilibrium, some characteristics of it, that make it pretty important or interesting for us as economists. So first things first, in market equilibrium, it's important to note that all trades that generate more benefit than costs are undertaken. So every trade where the benefit to the buyer outweighs the cost of, uh, to the seller of producing it, those trades are going to happen. At the same time, if we are in market equilibrium, no trades where the costs exceed the benefits are undertaken, or no situations where the cost of the seller is higher to the benefit to the buyer are uh, happening there if we are in that market equilibrium. So this is what we call economically efficient. Or again, everything where the benefits outweigh the costs are happening. And no transactions where the costs outweigh the benefits are happening. So again, you won't see any of those transactions in market equilibrium. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and draw ourselves out this uh, market equilibrium once again. Again, I set the full screen mode so we can use our different colors. But when drawing this graph, again, you're going to have that vertical axis and then a horizontal axis where we're going to be measuring price and quantity. Once again, we're going to have a downward sloping demand curve. It represents the idea that buyers prefer to buy more at lower prices. And then we're going to have an upward sloping supply curve. It represents the idea that sellers like to produce and sell more at higher prices. And again, where those two points intersect, you can get that market equilibrium we call Q star, uh, that's your equilibrium quantity, and then you have an uh, equilibrium price, which we're going to call P star. All right, so let's take a look at this idea that all transactions where the benefits outweigh the costs are undertaken. Let's take a look at that very first unit, or that very first uh, transaction. All right, if you go up to that supply curve here, this is going to represent the cost of producing that first unit to the seller. Remember that supply curve is just the marginal cost 
to the seller of producing a unit. Oop, didn't mean to do that. And so moving up to price there, that difference between the price and the cost of the seller, right? that's the extra amount that that adds to that seller's profit. But if you continue to travel up to the demand curve at that same one unit or one quantity, remember that this is the benefit to the buyer of that first unit. So again, the marginal benefit of producing that first unit uh, to the, or the marginal benefit of buying that first unit to the buyer outweighs the marginal cost of producing that first unit to the seller. So the benefits outweigh the cost of that first unit. That's definitely a transaction that's going to happen. Let's say we look at a different transaction. Let's take a look at that, say, second unit. Right. At that second unit, again, if you travel up to the supply curve, this is going to be the cost to the seller of producing and selling that second unit. So that's the marginal cost of unit two to that seller. Right. And then you're going to travel up to the uh, price. Again, that difference between price and the marginal cost of that second unit, right, that is going to be the uh, extra amount that the seller gets to take home to their families. And then you travel up to the demand curve, and that is the marginal benefit to the buyer of producing and buying that uh, second unit. So again, the marginal benefit to the buyer of buying that second unit outweighs the marginal cost to the seller of producing and selling that third unit. And again, you can do the same thing for say maybe the next unit, unit three. Again, you travel up to the supply curve and this is the cost to the seller of producing and selling that third unit. Again, the difference between that and the price is what they get to take home in profits. And that's the extra happiness they get from producing and selling that third unit. And then we keep traveling up to the demand curve, and that is the benefit to the buyer of producing and selling that third unit. And so again, we can see that the benefits outweigh the cost of unit three. So all these transactions, units one, two, and three, are going to happen if we're in market equilibrium. Right, and continue to happen up until maybe that fourth transaction. That's where the benefit to the buyer is going to be equal to the cost to the seller. So here at unit four, that's the benefit to the buyer of buying that fourth unit. That is going to be equal to the cost to the seller of producing and selling that uh, fourth unit. Right now. Those are all the transactions where the benefits all the way, outweigh the cost. Those are happening in market equilibrium. Now, if we were to keep on going to, say, a fifth transaction, well, the benefit of that fifth unit to the buyer is going to be lower than the cost of producing and selling that fifth unit to the seller. So any transaction beyond Q star, notice that it's switched now. The supply curve is higher than the demand curve. So the cost to the seller outweighs the benefits to the buyer. So this is a transaction that you are not going to see happen here, right? You're not going to see that transaction or any transactions beyond Q star, right? So again, if the costs outweigh the benefits, those transactions are not happening in this market equilibrium. Only those transactions where the benefits outweigh the costs are definitely happening in market equilibrium. Right. So again, that's one key uh, point or uh, characteristic of market equilibrium. It's economically efficient that, again, if you're in market equilibrium, all the benefits, uh, all the transactions where the benefits outweigh the costs are occurring. None of the transactions where the costs outweigh the benefits are occurring. Right. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and move on and talk a little bit else uh, about this uh, a little bit more about this market equilibrium, rather. So the market equilibrium is also economically efficient in that there is no excess supply or excess demand, right? So just to make sure that we understand, excess supply is a situation in which quantity supplied is greater than quantity demanded. You're not going to see that happen if we are in market equilibrium because where quantity supplied is exactly equal to the quantity demanded or the amount offered for sale is exactly equal to the amount that people want to buy at that price. So there's no excess supply or situation where we're producing a lot of goods that nobody wants. There's also no excess demand where quantity demand is greater than quantity supplied, 
right? There are no situation where people are lined up for goods that just don't exist. So again, when we're in market equilibrium, quantity demanded is, is exactly equal to quantity supply. So you have no excess supply or surplus. You also have no excess demand or shortage. So let's go ahead and graph that out real quickly. All right, so in drawing this graph, again, we are going to have a vertical axis and a horizontal axis. Once again, you have price up here on the vertical axis. You have quantity down here on the horizontal axis. And again, we have an upward sloping supply curve and a downward sloping demand curve. And again, where there's two intersect, we're going to have an equilibrium quantity or Q star and an equilibrium price or P star. And for the sake of argument, we're going to say that equilibrium price is $10. So what happens if you have a price that is higher than $10 or higher than that equilibrium price? Well, let's say that you have a price that is, uh, say, like $12. So I'm going to abbreviate this as P uh, superscript H. That just represents a price that is too high or any price that is higher than our equilibrium price. Okay, so where this new high price is hitting our uh, demand curve, it is going to give us quantity demanded at that price. And then where that same new high price of $12 hits the supply curve, that's going to give us quantity supplied at that price. And if you notice, they're no longer the same. Quantity supplied is now greater than quantity demanded. That is, again, what we call excess supply. or a surplus of goods. So again, I want you to think uh, through this. If you were running a store and you noticed that you had an excess supply of goods sitting on the shelves, or you had goods sitting there that nobody wanted to buy, just rotting away, what might you be inclined to do? Well, you might be inclined to lower the price of those goods in order to sell them. If you did that, then again, that would uh, cause people to want to buy these goods more. Again, as a buyer, we like buying more at lower prices. So we're going to move along that demand curve to the right towards that market equilibrium. Uh, we're going to go out there and try to buy more at that lower price of $10 versus, say, that higher price of $12. At the same time, remember, sellers are not as eager to produce and sell something at a lower price of, say, $10 relative to $12. So we're going to be less eager to go out there and produce this good and bring it to the market. So the quantity supplied is going to decrease as you lower that price until we get to that equilibrium. So there's a natural tendency for that to happen in a free and unregulated market. If the price is higher than the equilibrium price, quantity supplied will exceed quantity demanded, creating excess supply. But then the market mechanism will naturally push that price down, increasing people's desire to consume it and decreasing people's desire to produce it until quantity demanded is equal to quantity supply. Now, conversely, if you were to have a price that is too low, so we'll just abbreviate a low price with P subscript L. We'll say a price of like $8. So any price that is lower than the equilibrium price. Then again, where that low price hits the supply curve, notice it's going to hit the supply curve first this time. That's going to give us quantity supplied at that particular price. And then where it hits the demand curve, that's going to give us quantity demanded at that particular price. Notice that now quantity demanded exceeds quantity supplied, or what we call in the game excess demand, or sometimes referred to as a shortage, which during the coronavirus outbreak, we've certainly experienced in terms of things like toilet paper or hand sanitizer, or in some cases, eggs, milk, or bread, things that people tend to want to buy uh, more of. Right. So again, naturally, if you're a store, what you might expect to do, or if you're somebody managing a store, what you might expect to do, if you see people lined up for a good that you just can't keep on the shelf at that particular price, is you might go ahead and raise the price of those goods. Now, as you raise the price of those goods, that encourages producers to go out there and produce more of this stuff. Bring more, say, eggs, milk, or toilet paper to the market because they know they can get a greater reward in terms of selling it for a higher price for doing so. So it's going to increase quantity supplied. At the same time, people are not nearly as eager to buy this stuff at the higher price. 
So it's going to reduce our quantity demanded until again we get back to the equilibrium. And that's why we call that the equilibrium price. Again, is the price that removes all excess supply or excess demand from the market. Again, quantity demanded will equal quantity supplied in that market equilibrium. So those are some important characteristics to understand about that market equilibrium. Make sure you kind of know those things moving forward. We're going to talk about how, um, again, these incremental units will shift as we are moving towards an equilibrium in future graphs that are related to things like the optimal level of pollution. So it's important you kind of learn this concept now. So moving forward, that's kind of what you learned in our intro to Econ or Econ 3 about market equilibrium. Now, if you've taken intermediate economics or Econ 104A, then you might have spent more time actually calculating out the equilibrium price and quantity. Uh, so again, if you've taken that, this will be a bit of a review for you. If you haven't taken that, then this might be new for you. But don't worry, we're going to go through it step by step to make sure you understand. All right. So let's do some math. Uh, in this particular case, we're going to calculate, market, uh, calculate out market equilibrium, uh, the equilibrium price and equilibrium quantity. And then a little bit later, we're actually going to calculate out these things called consumer surplus, producer surplus, and total welfare. So let's go ahead and exit that full screen mode so we can use the different colors. Right, so we've got demand and supply here. I've got an equation for demand, and that is equal, and that is uh, price is equal to 400 minus 5 times quantity demanded. And then we've got an equation for supply, that is price is equal to 40 plus 3 times quantity supply. Now, even if I didn't tell you that was the demand or supply equation, even if I didn't have QD and QS, I just had Q there, you should be able to recognize which one is demand and which one is supply by looking at things like this negative sign. Whenever price and quantity are inversely related, meaning that at a higher price, we tend to buy less of something, right? That is going to be the demand equation. And anytime you see that price and quantity are positively or directly related, then you should be able to recognize that that is the supply equation, right? So again, if you see P and Q positively related, that is our supply equation. If you see P and Q negatively related, that is our demand equation. That's important um, in case I don't necessarily give you those details. You can figure them out on your own. So again, let's go ahead and draw a graph, set this up, and then we'll talk about how to calculate out this equilibrium. So here we got our equilibrium price, or sorry, uh, here we have our price that we're measuring on the vertical axis and quantity that we're measuring on our horizontal axis. And um, before we actually start drawing these curves, we need to take a look at where these curves are going to start and end up, right? So in other words, where is this demand curve going to start on this vertical axis? Well, in order to figure that out, we need to figure out what the uh, PE or price is when our quantity is equal to zero. So in order to figure out the vertical intercept for that demand curve, we need to set quantity demanded equal to zero. So when... QD is equal to zero, notice that price is equal to $400. So we know that our demand curve is going to start up here at $400. So it's going to start at this point here. And again, we know that our demand curve is downward sloping from left to right. And it's going to hit that x-axis. And again, we can calculate out exactly where it is going to hit that x-axis by setting our price equal to zero. So uh, when P is equal to zero, again, we can solve for that uh, quantity demanded, right, by basically setting um, uh, 400 minus 5 QD equal to zero, right? In order to do that, this is going to be zero is equal to 400 minus 5QD. Again, basically what that turns into is bringing that 5QD to the other side. 5QD is equal to 400. So we know that our quantity demanded is equal to 80. Didn't mean to do that. Sorry about that. All right. So we know it's going to hit the x-axis there at 80, right? So again, you can figure out exactly where this demand curve is going to start and end. And that's going to be important again later on as we do more complicated graphs and math in this class. So again, we know that the demand curve is going to start at $400 by
by setting that Q equal to zero and solving that that P is equal to 400. That's sometimes referred to as the demand choke price. In other words, $400 is the price that chokes off demand in the sense that nobody's willing to buy it at that price. And then we can find out where it hits the x-axis uh, by, again, setting P equal to zero and solving for Q. Right. And then we can do the same thing for supply. We need to know when uh, or where supply is going to start or where it's going to uh, originate on that vertical axis. And we can do that by setting QS equal to zero. So for supply, when QS is equal to zero, we know that price is equal to 40. So you might find $40, say, down here somewhere. And so that is where our supply curve is going to originate. Now, real briefly, before we draw the supply curve, I want you to take a quick note at those equations again. Notice that for the demand curve, that is negative 5QD. For the supply curve, that is positive 3QS. So the magnitude of the slope for demand is going to be higher than the magnitude of the slope for supply. In other words, the demand curve is going to be a little bit steeper than our supply curve if we're trying to draw these things to scale. Right, so again, we're going to have a supply curve that looks a little bit flatter than demand. we got supply there versus our demand curve there. And again, where these two curves intersect, we are going to have a market equilibrium that gives us our Q star and our equilibrium price P star. All right. Now we can calculate out what that equilibrium quantity and price uh, are by setting these equations equal to one another. So we know that in market equilibrium, QD is equal to QS. So they're going to be the same Q. And so all we got to do is set our demand equal to supply. Or set these two equations equal to one another so that 400 minus 5q is equal to 40 plus 3q and then all we got to do from there is move our q's together so we're going to add 5q over to the other side so that's going to be equal to 8q over here and then we are going to subtract 40 from the other side so that's going to be 360 over here so we know that 8Q is equal to 360, so we divide both sides by 8, and so that our Q star, or equilibrium quantity, is going to be equal to 45. So 45 is our equilibrium quantity here, and we can use that now to figure out what our equilibrium price will be. And you can do that by plugging that 45 or Q star into either one of those equations for demand or supply. Or if you're like me, you want to do both just to make sure you did it right. So in other words, if you plug into that demand equation, then we got 400 minus 5 times that Q star, or 45. So 400 minus 5 times 45 is equal to 400 minus 225, or $175. Now, in order to check and make sure we do it right, it's always a safe bet to plug it into the other equation as well, because it should be the same if you did it correctly. So we know that P is equal to 40 plus 3Q star. So again, we're just going to plug that 45 in there. So 3 times 45 is equal to 135 plus 40 is, again, $175. So we know that is our equilibrium price. So from there, we can figure out, again, our equilibrium price and quantity once you've got the graph set up um, by setting that demand and supply equation equal to each other, right, recognizing that those two Qs, quantity and demand and quantity supplied, will be equal to one another in market equilibrium. All right, so that's how you do it. Make sure you can do that on the uh, future homeworks and exams because this will be something that you will definitely have to do. Right. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and move forward and talk about a couple definitions, and then we're going to return to this graph and do a few more calculations. So a definition that I want to make sure you understand moving forward is consumer surplus. So consumer surplus is the difference between the maximum amount a consumer would be willing to pay for something, or essentially, again, that marginal benefit to the buyer, and then the amount that they actually end up paying, which is the price. So again, consumer surplus is the difference between the most the buyer would be willing to pay 
which is represented by that demand curve, and then the amount that they actually pay, which is the price of the good. So consumer surplus is the area under the demand curve, but above price. Having said that, there's also a thing called producer surplus, and that is the difference between the minimum price a seller is willing to accept, essentially the marginal cost of producing the good, and then the price that they actually receive. Right? So again, it's the difference between the lowest price the seller is willing to accept when they sell something, which is given by the supply curve, and then the price that they actually receive, or the price that they actually sell it for. Right? So it's the area above the supply curve, but below price. So, so, cons so consumer surplus is the area under the demand curve, but above price, whereas producer surplus is the area above the supply curve, but below price. So returning back to this graph, right, if you're asking which area here represents consumer surplus, again, it is the area that is below the demand curve, but above the price of the good, or the area of this triangle here. Now, if you're asking which area represents producer surplus, that is the area, again, above the supply curve, but below price, or the area of this triangle here. Right. So again, this is what we call producer surplus, and this is what we call consumer surplus. And once again, we can actually calculate that out using all the numbers that we've uh, just calculated here recently when uh, uh, creating this graph. So consumer surplus, again, is just going to be the area of that triangle. And hopefully you recognize that the area of a triangle is equal to one-half the base of that triangle times the height of that triangle. Uh, that's a formula from your high school geometry class, which uh, hopefully you're now remembering. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about how to calculate this out. All right, so that's equal to one-half. Now, what represents the base of this triangle? Well, the base of the triangle is essentially the distance between zero and Q star here. So in other words, the base of this triangle is being represented by that number that is Q star, our equilibrium quantity. And then the height of the triangle is the difference between that demand intercept or that demand choke price, which we calculated earlier as 400, minus the uh, actual price that you end up selling it for, right? Or that equilibrium price, which is P star, right? So let's go ahead and plug in those numbers. So our consumer surplus is one half of 45 times that 400 minus 175. That's the height of that particular uh, triangle there, right? So again, this 225 here, that's the difference between those. That represents the height of that triangle, whereas the 45 represents the base of that triangle. So it's one half of uh, 45 times 225. And if you throw that into your calculator, which is allowed for an exam, by the way, then that should give you $5,062.50. All right, so that's how you calculate consumer surplus. Let's talk a little bit about calculating producer surplus. It's the same story in terms of how you do it. So again, producer surplus is also the area of a triangle, which is still equal to one half base times height. That formula hasn't changed, right? So that's gonna be equal to one half the base of that triangle, which is the same as it was for consumer surplus. Again, it's that same Q star. And then the height of that triangle is the difference between price or P star minus that supply intercept or that supply choke price, the price at which people are willing to supply any, right? So again, we can go ahead and throw these numbers in to this equation. So that's one half of 45 times 175 minus 40, or again, that's where um, our uh, supply curve starts when we set quantity equal to zero. So again, we can go ahead and do a little bit of math here, math this out, so that's one half 
45 times 135. And again, if you want to throw that into your calculator, that is equal to 3,037.50. All right. And then there's one final thing I want to talk about here, and that is this uh, formula or equation for what we call total welfare. And total welfare is just equal to your consumer surplus plus your producer surplus. So when you add consumer and producer surplus together, you get total welfare. So our consumer surplus is the $5,062.50 plus our producer surplus, which is that uh, $3,037.50. So we can add those two together, and that should give us a pretty even $8,100. So that's your total welfare. That's just consumer surplus and producer surplus added together. Again, consumer surplus kind of represents that extra happiness to the consumers, uh, and then the producer surplus represents that extra happiness to the producers. So you add that together. That's, again, what we call that total welfare. So if you able to calculate consumer surplus, producer surplus, and total welfare, on a future homework or exam. Again, if I give you a set of equations. All right. So now there's a lot of math there at once, but again, you will need to be able to understand uh, uh, this kind of math moving forward. It's not hard math to do as long as you kind of recognize uh, where you can start uh, finding these numbers from these particular equations. So again, if you're struggling with this, let me know uh, with a uh, uh, email or come visit me in the Zoom office hours and I'll be happy to work through some more examples with you. Uh, but moving forward here, so we talked about consumer surplus and producer surplus and how to calculate total welfare by adding, adding them together. Now let's go ahead and move on and talk a little bit about this idea of perfectly competitive markets and how to analyze the decisions made by individual firms within a perfectly competitive market. So this is stuff that you would have learned towards the end of Econ 3 or the intro to micro class if you have indeed taken it. So perfectly competitive markets have five key characteristics that I want to make sure that you know and understand. So the first characteristic is that there are a large number of firms and consumers in the market, so no one producer or consumer can really change the price. For that reason, we often refer to these firms as price taker firms, and these are usually our agricultural producers, like the uh, orange producers we were talking about at the beginning of this chapter. So again, if you're a somebody who produces uh, oranges, chances are you're not the only orange producer around. There are a large number of orange farmers out there uh, making and are producing and selling oranges, right? You, in fact, you've probably seen a bunch around Riverside. You see a bunch of orange or, uh, orchards around, right, where oranges are being produced, right? All, all, of these pro all of these products are identical. So again, there are a large number of orange farmers, all of which are producing identical oranges. Right, you wouldn't be able to recognize the difference in oranges from, we'll say, one farmer versus another. Right, so again, all products are identical. Some people might be like, wasn't well, there a difference between organic oranges and regular oranges? Yes, there is, but organic oranges are their own market, and then regular oranges are their own separate market. So again, all regular oranges being produced by one farmer are the same as all regular oranges being produced by a different farmer. Right, they're identical. There are no barriers to entry or exit in this market. Anybody can jump in and start selling oranges if they like, right? So it's pretty easy to jump in and out of this particular industry. Again, all you got to do is get some orange trees and plant them, and before you know it, you are an orange producer. There are low costs to obtaining information and engaging in transactions, so it's easy for, again, consumers and producers to find each other and engage in these uh, transactions. So again, low cost to uh, engaging in exchanges. And then finally, firms can sell all they want at the market price. So again, however much the price for oranges are, right, firms can sell all they want at that price. So they don't again, get to choose what the price is. They, get, they have to sell their oranges for whatever the uh, price in the orange market is. So they don't choose the price, but they do, they do get to choose how much to produce and sell. And again, they're going to do that based off of the information being faced by that particular firm in the industry. And one thing that we've kind of already mentioned, but I want to make sure you understand, for these perfectly competitive price taker firms, price is equal to marginal revenue. 
So the price of the uh, product that they're selling is the equivalent to the marginal revenue they receive from selling that product. And again, let's go through another example of that to make sure we understand how this works. So in order to go through this example, I'm going to go ahead and give you a formula. So total revenue is equal to price times quantity. Right, so that's your formula for total revenue. Again, that's not necessarily your profit because you have to subtract out your cost from that to get your profit. But total revenue is the amount of money that goes in your cash register. So if you're selling, say, oranges for a dollar each and you sell four oranges at a price of a dollar each, then that is four dollars that goes into your cash register, register. That is total revenue. Again, that is not the amount you get to take home at the end of the day because you have to subtract from that the costs or what it took to get those $4 into your cash register, right? So let's say that the price here is the same price that we calculated in our uh, last graph, and that was a price that was equal to $175. So that's our equilibrium price. Let's say that we are selling, say, flats or boxes of oranges uh, for that particular price. Well, as you might imagine, the total revenue when you don't produce and sell any oranges is going to be equal to zero because no matter what the price is, any price multiplied by zero is zero. But if we make and sell that first uh, box of oranges, then our total revenue is that price of 175 times that quantity of one. That is $175 that goes into our cash register. If we produce and sell two boxes of oranges, then that is 175 times two or $350 that goes into our cash register. Now, if we are producing and selling three boxes of oranges, that is 175 times three or 525 that goes into the cash register. If we are producing and selling four boxes of oranges, then that is 175 times four or an even 700 that goes into our cash register. So that is how you calculate total revenue. In order to figure out marginal revenue, then the formula for that is that's equal to the change in total revenue divided by the change in quantity. Again, marginal just means additional. So how much additional total revenue are we getting from producing and selling these uh, additional units, right? So again, if we're calculating the marginal revenue of say that first unit, right? Because of course there is no marginal revenue when you're not selling any. But as we go from selling zero units to selling one unit, notice that our total revenue goes from zero to 175 so our marginal revenue or additional revenue that we're adding to our cash register from producing selling that first unit is $175. Now, if we are going from producing, say, one unit to two units, then we're going from 175 to 350. Again, that is a change of $175. That is what is being added to our cash register from producing and selling that second unit. So what is the marginal revenue from that third unit? Well, as we go from two units to three units, our total revenue goes from 350 to 525. Once again, that is 175. And hopefully you've guessed by now that the marginal revenue of producing and selling that fourth unit is again $175. So once again, marginal revenue is equal to whatever the price of the good is, right? In this case, that is 175. That is true for price takers universally. So if you are a perfectly competitive price taker firm, then the marginal revenue is going to be equal to the price for you. Whatever the market price is, that is the marginal revenue of selling an additional unit. All right, so again, make sure you know that rule moving forward. That's going to be important for understanding um, how to calculate out the uh, firm's uh, decision-making process in the future. So let's go ahead and get into that decision-making process by exploring some cost functions. So again, I told you that the total revenue isn't what the firm gets to take home at the end of the day. They have to subtract from that their costs in order to figure out what their profits are. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of these cost functions. So a firm has what's called variable costs, and variable costs are costs that change with output. So again, our variable costs are costs that change with output. So again, if you're growing oranges, the more oranges that you are trying to grow, then maybe the more seeds you need, the more water you're going to need, the more fertilizer you're going to need. These are all what we call variable costs. So a firm might have a variable cost formula that looks something like this. So your variable cost formula might be, say, 10Q squared plus 75Q. 
And thus, all those cues there mean that if you are growing more units, or say, of oranges, or increasing your output of anything that you're producing, then it's going to make those variable costs increase. And that is different than what we call fixed costs. And fixed costs are costs that do not change with output. So, for example, if you're growing oranges, it doesn't matter how many oranges you grow, something like your insurance premium is probably going to be the same. Right? So whether you're growing one unit or a thousand units, or um, whether or not you are um, producing a thousand units or 10,000 units, these costs do not change. This might include things, again, like your insurance premiums or maybe taxes on the land. This is going to be the same regardless of how much you produce. So a uh, equation for fixed costs might look something like this. Right, fixed costs might be equal to 125. Notice that there are no Qs there, right? Because again, these are costs that do not change with output, right? So if you're setting up your orange growing business and you have to do things like um, uh, rent a building or uh, again, pay your insurance premium, then these are the costs that are gonna exist before you even start production. So whether quantity is zero, 1,000 or 10,000, your fixed costs are gonna stay the same. So total costs are just your variable costs plus your fixed costs. So your total cost equation in this case would be equal to that 10Q squared plus 75Q plus 125. So we're just combining those two equations. You just add your fixed costs to your variable costs, and that is going to be your total costs, right? So marginal cost is the change in total cost required to produce an additional unit of output, right? So again, is the change in total cost required to produce an additional unit of output. And um, for those of you who have uh, had what we call Math 9A at this university, and notice, you might notice that Math 9A is indeed a prerequisite for this course. It is a prerequisite for this one reason only, and that is to calculate out these marginal costs or this marginal cost equation from your total cost equation. So in order to figure out our marginal cost equation, marginal cost is just the derivative of total cost with respect to quantity, right? So that little symbol there, that's just how we uh, denote a derivative in mathematics. I don't know if you remember this idea of uh, taking or calculating a derivative, but if you have a function, do it up here, so if you have a function equal to, say, um, call it ax to the b power, right, then in order to calculate a derivative of that function with respect to x, then you take that uh, b down and multiply it times your base equation. So that's b a to times x. And then you subtract 1 from that exponent, so that's b minus 1, right? So that is why you have to take Math 9a for this class, so that you can take that simple derivative uh, for that uh, reason, and that reason only, that is, a, that is why that math class is a prerequisite. So if we were to take the derivative of our total cost function with respect to q, here is what it would look like, right? Again, we would take this uh, 10q squared, and we take that 2 down and multiply it, by 10, so that's 20 Q, because again, you subtract one from that exponent. And then that 75 uh, Q just becomes 75. Again, we just take that uh, uh, one exponent that's on that Q, multiply it by 75, so that's just 75. Subtract one from that exponent, that's Q to the zero power, which is also just one. And then that 125 or that fixed cost just goes away. So our marginal cost equation there is just 20Q plus 75. Again, if you've had Math 9A like you're supposed to as a prereq for this class, that'll be pretty easy for you. If not, don't worry about it. Most times I just give you that marginal cost equation. But that is how you calculate it should you uh, be curious to do so. It's just the derivative of the total cost with respect to quantity. And then the final uh, type of cost that we're going to be talking about are average total costs. And average total cost is just total cost divided by quantity. So our average total cost equation is just going to be equal to our total cost equation divided by Q. So we're going to take that total cost equation and we're just going to divide, uh, divide it by Q all the way through. right? So that's going to be equal to 10Q plus 75 plus 125 divided by Q. 
right? So again, if I give you the variable cost and the fixed cost, be able to figure out what the total cost, marginal cost, and average total cost equations are. It uh, again shouldn't be too compl complicated, particularly if you've had that math 9A class. This is about as hard as the math gets this quarter, other than just finding areas of the triangles. So uh, if you can do this much math, then you should be good to go for the rest of this course. All right. All right. So let's go ahead and analyze the decisions made by individual firms in these perfectly competitive markets. So when it comes down to profit maximization, again, firms maximize profits by producing where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. We talked about that in that last uh, video for this chapter, for part one. So again, just to reiterate, the golden rule for maximizing profits for all firms is to produce where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. And again, for a price taker firm, that marginal revenue is equal to price. So it's the same thing as saying that you're going to produce where the marginal cost equation is equal to the price of the good. Right. So again, let's go ahead and go through that calculation and make sure that we can calculate where this firm is going to maximize profits. So again, the uh, formula is MC equals MR. We know that our MC equation from what we calculated last time, we can go ahead and exit our full screen mode here so that we can use our different colors. So that MC equation is 20Q plus 75. And then our marginal revenue, which was price, that we had calculated earlier, earlier was $175. All right, so again, we're just going to move that 75 to the other side. So we're going to subtract it from both sides. So it's going to give you 20Q is equal to 100. And it works out nicely to where our profit maximizing quantity for this particular firm is 100 divided by 20, which is five units. All right, so that's how many units this firm is going to produce in order to maximize those profits. So again, we can go ahead and graph that out using a price taker firm graph, which again, hopefully you'll remember from Econ 3. But if you don't, don't worry, we're going to go through it step by step here. To make sure you get it. All right, so again, this is going to be our uh, price here. This is going to be our quantity here. And again, remember that a uh, curve uh, or a marginal cost curve for these types of firms are going to look something like this. And remember, the marginal revenue is constant at $175, right? So wherever you have that uh, price of, say, $175, you're going to have a very flat demand curve here. This is going to be the demand for this firm's products. Again, this is where price is equal to marginal revenue. For this particular firm right and then again if you want to draw in that average total cost uh, curve you can also do that your average total cost curve is going to have this u shape to it looking something like this and from there we can figure out again where this firm is going to maximize profits and even calculate how much uh, profits it's going to have. So again, where marginal cost intersects marginal revenue, that is going to be your profit maximizing quantity, which we're going to call Q star here. Notice that anywhere between zero and Q star, our marginal revenue curve is above our marginal cost curve. So it's going to pay for the firm to produce those particular units. Anywhere beyond Q star, the marginal cost curve is greater than the marginal revenue curve, so the firm is not going to be producing those units. And we know from our last calculation that that Q star is going to be equal to 5, right? So again, anywhere between 0 and 5 units, marginal revenue outweighs marginal cost. Anywhere beyond Q star or those 5 units, notice that marginal revenue is less than marginal cost. So that's why that profit maximizing quantity or Q star is indeed five units. All right. So again, we can calculate out uh, the total revenue for this particular uh, firm. Again, total revenue is equal to price times quantity. And 
here we're going to use our profit maximizing quantity here. So you can both find that on the graph and we can calculate it here using some math. So again, our total revenue box is going to be this blue box here. It's going to be this price of 175 times this Q star or profit maximizing quantity of five units. So again, that's going to represent our total revenue. And again, we can calculate it as 175 times five. And that's going to give us a total revenue of $875. Now we can also calculate out our total cost, right? So total cost is equal to average total cost times quantity, or again, the Q star that we are choosing to produce. And we can find that on the graph. Our average total cost is given to us by this average total cost curve. So where that hits that Q star, this is going to be our cost per unit. And we can actually calculate our average total cost out at uh, that uh, Q star of five units, right, by looking at uh, this particular equation that we that we figured out last time. Remember that ATC is equal to 10Q plus 75 plus 125 divided by Q. And so if we're going to be producing five units, then that's going to be 10 times 5 plus 75 plus 125 divided by 5. Or again, if you want to math that out, that's 50 plus 75 plus 25, or 150 is our average total cost, or our cost per unit. Right. So again, if we wanted to see where that hits that curve, it would be right here at 150. So again, our total cost is our $150 in average total cost times our Q star of five units. And so that comes out to $750 in total cost. Or again, you can think of our uh, total cost as the area of this red box here, which is just, again, average total cost times that Q star. All right. so again, we've got some total revenue and we've got some total cost. If you want to figure out profit, then the formula for profit is just subtracting our total cost from our total revenue. So again, profit is just our total revenue minus total cost. Or it's how much of this total revenue big blue box we have left over after subtracting out that red total cost box. All right. So this right here is what represents our profit. And again, we have a total revenue of $875. We've got a total cost of $750. So that's going to give us a profit of $125. Or another way to think of it is you have a profit of $25 per unit times five units, right? That's how you're going to get that $125, right? So that's how you calculate profit, and that's how you find it on a graph of a price taker firm. Again, all that should be a review from your Econ 3 class. Um, and again, kind of make sure you know how to do this moving forward because uh, we will be kind of going through some of these details again, particularly when we get to Chapter 7 on Renewable Resources and fisheries and how they make decisions. All right, so moving forward, uh, a couple things to note here about these price taker markets is again, remember that they are perfectly competitive and it means that it's easy for firms to get in and out of these and in and out of this industry uh, in the long run. So if firms are making an economic profit, then it's the case that new firms will enter and drive price down. So again, this is kind of a review from your Econ 3 class, but an economic profit means that you're making more money in this particular industry than you could make if you were using your resources for anything else. So again, if you go in there and you see a firm in a particular industry making a lot of money, just making a rain all around town, then you're going to think, how can I get a piece of that action? I need to get in that industry as well. 
So you're going to try to jump into that industry, compete with that existing firm, and this new competition will drive down prices to where firms are going to be making zero economic profit in the long run. So again, as firms open up, this increased competition is going to cause economic profit to go down to zero. Now, if firms are making an economic loss, then firms are going to leave the market because, again, an economic loss just means that you're making less money here than you could if you use your resources for their best uh, alternative uses. So if you're making economic losses, that means you're not doing as well as you could be if you use your resources for something else. So in the long run, firms are going to leave the market. That's going to reduce competition, which means prices can uh, go up for the firms that are remaining until they are making zero economic profit. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and graph out what a long-run equilibrium looks like in this price taker market. In order to do that, we're going to be drawing two graphs side by side. So again, if you are taking notes and following along at home, please make sure you leave, you leave enough room for two graphs right next to each other. So this is our market graph. We have price and quantity. This is going to be our individual producer. And again, in economics, we denote the individual producer with a lowercase p and q, whereas we denote the market with a capital P and Q. But I don't really care at all that you know that for this particular class. Uh, so that's kind of the notation difference, but it's not that big of a deal. I'm not really going to test you on that at all. all right, so again, we're going to have an upward sloping supply curve and a downward sloping demand curve that represents our market. And remember in this market, we calculated out a equilibrium quantity of 45 and we calculated out a equilibrium price of $175, right? And then again, that $175 represents the marginal revenue for an individual firm in that market. So again, this is what the demand looks like for their individual products. And again, for this uh, firm, that's where price is going to equal marginal revenue. So again, this is the individual firm or company, and this is the entire market, right? Now, again, you're gonna have an upward sloping marginal cost curve that's gonna look like this. So what's going to happen in long-run equilibrium? Well, in long-run equilibrium, this demand curve is going to move. Again, this firm is making economic profits. It's going to move in such a way that it's going to be just tangent to our average total cost curve. right? And this point here this is going to represent our long-run equilibrium where our, mar where our uh, total revenue is equal to our total cost so the firms will be making zero economic profit in the long run. And that's going to be this firm's profit maximizing quantity. That's Q star here. Now, just to make sure that uh, you're kind of putting all this together, when we looked at this graph and we calculated out the individual profit maximizing quantity of five units, that's how much this firm is producing in this particular market. And again, all these firms are about the same size. No one firm is dominating the other. So if this is a representative firm and it's producing five units as its profit maximizing quantity and we calculated out that the total amount being produced in the market is 45 units, then how many firms are in this market? Well, again, if each representative firm is producing five units and the market total is 45, that means that there are nine uh, price taker or perfectly competitive firms in this market. That's just that 45, which is the market uh, total quantity. Uh, divided by the uh, five units being produced by each firm or the profit maximizing level for each representative company in this industry, right? So again, this is a firm making zero economic profits, which is the long run equilibrium. Again, because if they're making positive economic profits, firms are going to jump in and compete away those profits down to zero. If they're making losses, firms are going to leave the industry until the remaining firms are making zero economic profit, right? So Again, long-run equilibrium occur when all firms in the industry are making zero economic profit. Now, a quick note here. Again, please remember from your uh, Econ 3 class that zero economic profit does not mean that this firm is failing. Right? They'd be making a lot of what we call accounting profits. This is, say, maybe uh, $3 million in accounting profit. What zero economic profit means 
is that they can make that same $3 million that they use their resources for all their best alternative uses. So zero economic profit does not mean the industry is failing. It just means that the firms in this industry are doing as well here as they could anywhere else. And that is it for your microeconomic review. So again, be able to use this equal marginal principle to minimize costs for a given level of production. If I give you a chart on a homework or exam, be able to tell me which production source they're going to use in, uh, first, what order they're going to use these production sources in, and then what's the total amount of uh, production uh, units that they're going to use from each source. Be able to calculate the equilibrium price and quantity from a set of equations. Again, be able to recognize what the supply and demand equations are, be able to set them equal to each other in order to figure out that equilibrium price and quantity. Know how to calculate consumer surplus and producer surplus. Again, consumer surplus is the area below the demand curve but above price, so be able to calculate the area of that triangle as one half base times height. Producer surplus is the area below price but above the supply curve. Again, it'll be the area of a triangle which again has that same one half base times height formula. Total welfare is just that consumer surplus and producer surplus added together. Know the characteristics of a perfectly competitive firm that we talked about in this uh, class and the definitions of their cost functions. Again, if I give you a uh, variable cost equation and a fixed cost equation, be able to figure out what the total cost equation is, what the marginal cost equation is, and what the average total cost equation is. Understand how firms maximize profits. Remember the profit maximizing rule is that marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. Be able to find the profit maximizing uh, quantity by setting MR equal to MC and then calculate the profits or losses being made by that firm. And then understand that firms make zero economic profit in the long run when it is a perfectly competitive market. So in long run equilibrium, all firms are making zero economic profit. Again, if a firm is making positive profit, profits in the short run, in the long run, new firms are going to jump in compete away those profits. If a firm is making economic losses in the short run, in the long run, those firms are going to leave so that the remaining firms can make those zero economic profits. And that is it for the microeconomic review. So again, if you've had Econ 3, most of this should have been a review with maybe a little bit uh, more math than you're used to, unless, of course, you've had Econ 104A, in which case it was all a review. If you haven't had Econ 104A, again, this chapter is kind of a bridge between your intro to micro and your intermediate micro class. Right? If you haven't had Econ 3 at all, if you're one of those people who gain access to the class uh, with special permission without a prerequisite, then again, make sure you kind of review this material a couple times. Make sure you understand what's going on and be sure to look up anything you need to look up that you didn't understand from this particular lecture. All right, so that is it for, um, again, Chapter 3. Let me know if you have any questions. You can shoot me an email or come visit me in those Zoom office hours. It's been a blast. If you like this stuff, Go ahead and hit that like button on your YouTube channel or uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Just joking, you don't got to do any of that stuff, right? I just hear it all the time when people are making YouTube videos. But uh, whether you liked it or not, again, be sure to hit me up if you have any questions. And I will see you all next time for Chapter 4, which will get even more graphical and mathematical, and in my opinion, even more interesting. Till then, take care and let me know if you need anything at all.